booktube Sarah here and welcome to my channel today I'm coming to you with my weekly reviews for August 25th through the 31st I finished seven books this week so it was a big reading week for me in comparison to what the last few weeks have been like um, and that's okay it was the end of the month I was finishing off a bunch of stuff and yeah so pretty pleased with that it's really funny because yesterday so I'm filming this on Sunday but on Saturday afternoon when I finished the two books that I was finishing up for the end of the month my currently reading list on Goodreads was at zero <laughs> I had nothing I was currently reading so I was super pleased with that that I got everything off the docket we start September nice and fresh and as of today I now have three books <laughs> on my currently reading list on Goodreads and that's perfectly fine new month new books super excited but let's talk about what I read last month or last last week I should say excuse me so the first book that I finished was The Blue by Lucy Clark this is of course a thriller uh, it was originally published in 2015 average rating on Goodreads of 4.04 stars I gave this one four and a half stars um, for challenges this I read for the thriller a thon round four um, that was hosted by uh, Harriet Rosie and um, two other ladies I will leave link to all three of their channels in the description box below and um, I don't know when the next round is gonna happen they it only goes for about a week but I had a lot of fun with it and I definitely think it is something I will participate in again but for that challenge it was the oldest thriller on my TBR and this one has been on my TBR for quite some time now I realized when I picked the book up and started it that I was I was already 36% of the way through it from like four years ago or three years ago so I obviously restarted the book from page one because I even as I started reading it I'm like yeah I kind of remember some of this but not all of it so obviously I mean if it's been four years since you've picked up a book maybe you should just go ahead and start it from the beginning so this one was really really good and it's I think highly underrated I have not heard anybody else talk about this book Cor correct me if I'm wrong um, and this is essentially it's got one of my favorite you know um, plot points or not plot points but um, styles of narrative that I really really like in a way I don't know if that's the phrasing that I should be using but it's a dual timeline story and that is catnip to me that is like a buzz phrase if you tell me a book has a dual timeline I'm all over it and I've said this before to you guys so it takes place um, the bulk of the story takes place like in the past and, and what happened over the course of like a four or five month period and then the part that takes place like it, it, it at every chapter at the top of each chapter will say then or now so you're not giving any exact dates um, which kind of really opens it up quite a bit so you're not kind of stuck at a particular time period but um, and that worked really well for the story but the then part took place like I said over four or five months and the now part takes place over the course of a single day so essentially what the plot of this story is and I don't want to give too much away because of course it is a thriller it's about um, these two girls who are from the UK and after our main character um, uh, I want to know her name's not Lucy that's the author's name Lana she has kind of a falling out with her father that you kind of find out about right at the very beginning her her best friend Kitty um, pack up and decide that they are gonna travel they literally spin a globe and wherever their finger lands with their eyes closed that's where they're gonna start and it's the Philippines and while they're in the Philippines they end up meeting with the meeting up with these other people who are living and traveling on this yacht called the blue which is where the title of the book comes from so they are asked to join the crew so it's Lana and Kitty are our two main characters and then we have um, Aaron and Denny and Shell and Heinrich I believe and Joseph are our other characters um, and it's kind of you know the then part is them kind of going on this you know this lovely adventure on this on this yacht through the Philippines and through that area they kind of travel towards um, New Zealand and stuff like that so it's, it's really really neat um, and then of course something happens while they're on the ship and I don't want to say anything more about the then part the now part again that you find out at the very beginning of the book so this is not any kind of a spoiler is that uh, Lana finds out she has she disembarked the ship months earlier and for about six months has been living in New Zealand because she knew that's where the ship was gonna last dock and again I don't want to say too much about why she decided to stay and wait for the ship but you know as you read the book you'll find all that out but she has just found out that the ship sunk and 
so the now part, as I said, takes place over the course of a day as she's kind of reliving what happened in those last few months on the boat and, you know, what happened to the friends and the friendships that she had and things like that. This book, it wasn't edge of your seat, nail biting, terrifying, but it was really, really good. It was, I just can't explain it. It was really gripping. You kept wanting to read more, especially when it would flip back and forth between then and now. And, you know, the dynamics between the characters was fantastic. And for me, it did have a slightly more on the edge of your seat um, fear factor for me in a way because small, like little known fact. Well, I don't know if it's a little known fact. I don't know if I've ever mentioned it here. I have a few fears in life like we all do. One of them for me is deep water. I am terrified, terrified of deep water. Um, I, it's not a fact that I can't swim. I can swim. You throw me in water, I will struggle to survive. I'll just be freaking out the entire time, which is not really that great. But I did almost make it to lifeguard certification. <laughs> I showed up for the first day to be certified, like to take the classes to be certified lifeguard. And our first task when I showed up, um, the community center, not far from my parents' house where I grew up, they have an Olympic sized swimming pool, um, along with Olympic, Olympic grade, I guess, um, diving boards and stuff like that. And I showed up and the teacher's like, all right, to start out, to warm up, we're going to do 20 laps of the pool. And I'm like, nope, I'm good. <laughs> Thanks so much. See you later. And I left and my mom's like, what are we doing? You're supposed to be. And I'm like, nope, I don't need to be certified lifeguard. <laughs> In the event of an incident, I can save myself and potentially others. Um, you know, but I do have an extreme fear of the ocean. It is a powerful and, you know, it's dangerous. It's, it's, it is trying to kill you, essentially. And there are parts in this book where a lot of people would read this and go, oh, that sounds so wonderful, where they're jumping off the boat into this beautiful crystal, te uh, you know, uh, teal colored water and, you know, aquamarine water or whatever. And, you know, they're splashing around and I'm just like, I'm getting the heebie-jeebies just thinking about it. <laughs> so, you know, your mileage may vary depending on your own feelings of the ocean. But in my case, not my favorite thing in the world. Um, but yeah, it was still highly enjoyable. Even if you are an ocean lover, you might even love this one that much more. Um, the boat part of it, I was fine with. Like, I've been on a cruise. I am perfectly fine, you know, with, you know, um, uh, not water beneath my feet, but you know, like, um, like, you know, plank board or whatever, you know, on a boat. I'm perfectly fine with that. And I'm happy on land. I am a Pisces too, which is funny. And usually we love water, but, and I loved water as a kid. I used to paddle in the ocean all the time when we used to go to Myrtle Beach when I was a little kid. And then one time I had an experience where I got caught by a rogue wave and um, was kind of pulled out and had to be like rescued by a lifeguard kind of an idea. And I think that very quickly made me realize how dangerous the ocean can actually be and how very quickly something can change. Um, so yeah, I, I, I highly respect it. And you know, so, but anyway, that was a whole side tangent about this book, but I, I just, I loved this book. I thought it was fantastic. And you know, like I said, it's very underrated in my opinion um, because I have not heard anybody else talk about it. Um, on booktube at least but it it's I, I I encourage you to give it a shot if you like thrillers um the next one that I finished again for thrillerathon was murder on the orient express by Agatha Christie um this was of course a mystery it is Hercule I cannot say his name it's Perot it's Perot I don't know I don't speak French uh, book number 10 you know the guy the guy with the mustache um it was this was narrated on audio brilliantly i might add the narration on this was super fantastic by a gentleman by the name of dan stevens he did a great great job um this was originally published in 1934 uh average rating on goodreads of 4.16 stars i give it four stars i'm not going to get into the plot of this one i'm sure everybody and his brother knows i've never seen the movie um the newer one with john is it johnny depp he's in all the things um but I'm pretty sure he's in it. And I kind of want to see it now because I'm interested to see how they um, took the book and put it on the big screen because there's not a lot of action in this book. Let's be honest, for those of you who have read it. Um, it it's an interesting book and I liked it. Like the, the basic plot of this is, is that there's all these strangers on a train together and someone ends up murdered and Perot or Perot or however you say his name, the guy with the mustache spends the entire book trying to figure out who done it. And what I really loved about it is that I felt like it was a giant game of Clue. Like, he was laying all the facts out for the reader 
and it was up to you to try and figure it out. Do you know what I mean? Like it just felt that way. Like even the chapters were like titled, you know, interview with this person or evidence from this or whatever that, you know, it was all being laid out for you. This groundwork was being laid out for you and you as the reader were needing to play detective. And I thought that was just delightful. Maybe I read it differently than some people, but that's how I took the book. And I really, really liked it. Um, in true Agatha Christie style, I was surprised, sort of, kind of, I was surprised, yeah, at the ending. Um, you know, I, I thought it was, it was, it was very interesting. Um, I, I wouldn't have guessed it, uh, how that, that, that that is how it would have turned out but still absolutely delightful if you've only seen the movie and you haven't read the book like I got my copy my audio copy from overdrive um, from my library so guaranteed your library probably has it the audiobook that I listened to with Dan Stevens narrating in case you're curious has the same cover that I have posted up here this is what the audiobook cover looks like so I highly recommend it I mean there are so many different characters in this story and they're all different nationalities and he does a brilliant job of the accents really really great super fantastic uh, you know I just want to read more Agatha Christie now I, I am debating in October I think there's another um Perot, Perot I keep saying it wrong I'm so sorry I can hear it being said in my head and I know it's coming out of my mouth completely incorrectly um but there's one called Halloween Party I think or is that a Miss Marple story I don't know but I, I want to get my hands on it and read it in October because I think it would be a lot of fun. I am, you know, I'm slowly becoming a fan of Agatha Christie. Uh, I've read, of course, and then there were none, which I loved. I absolutely loved. Um, that was a five-star read for me. But I want to read more. So if you guys have any suggestions on some of your favorite Agatha Christie books, please post them in the comments below because I want to read all of them. And I'm thinking I might compile what you guys tell me and maybe try and read one a month next year or something like that. That would be kind of fun. I could work my way through the, uh, you know, the Mustache Guys series <laughs> or the Miss Marple series. But I think it'd be more fun to kind of read the ones that you guys recommend to me too. So yeah, anyway, just a side note if you're interested in doing that. Um, the next book that I finished sadly was not as good as some of the other ones. I think this was my least favorite book of the, of the, of the week. And it was The Bachelor Ranger by, um, Rebecca Winters. This is a contemporary romance novel. It is book number one in the Creature Comfort series. Harlequin American Romance number 1339. Um, this was originally published in 2011. I'm sorry for the ugly stickers on it. Um, uh, Average rating on Goodreads of 3.67 stars. I only gave it three stars. This was for my, this, this is part of my 40 Years of Harlequin project, my 2011 book, so yay. Um, this I also used for Summer Romance Book Bingo. I did end up changing around one of the categories at the very end, um, but that's okay because as with all my read-alongs or read-a-thons or anything like that, it's completely subject to change. You guys do whatever works for you. I'm hosting the challenge. I can do whatever the, whatever the hex I want. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll see that in another book that I read this week um and I, I had a different category and I could not like because I moved some of my TBR around because I was participating in Thriller-a-thon so I had to I had to make do and I looked at all the categories I'm like oh I didn't get the one for the cat or dog on the cover so I subbed <laughs> but I still ended up getting a full bingo card spoiler alert you guys um so yeah so that is that so this is the story of Alex and Cal and I think what I disliked the most about the story were our two characters, um, which is kind of pivotal when you're talking about a romance novel. You kind of sort of need to like the characters or what's the point of reading the story. Um, so um, essentially what this is, it's uh, Alex. Uh, she works with uh, for her mother's foundation, which is working with um, Native American children and trying to get them exposed to more things outside of their reservation and she uh is it Yellowstone Yosemite Yosemite National Park so she ends up um signing her boys up like these some of these um uh teenagers in this on this Indian reservation um uh to work spend the summer volunteering at Yosemite Yosemite I've completely forgotten about this book already and I like finished it on Tuesday um <laughs> I really didn't care for it that much. I, sh I, you know, now in retrospect, I'm thinking about it, I probably should have gone with a two and a half star, but I, I'll, I'll leave my star rating where it is because there's no point in me changing it right now. Um, so anyway, she shows up there and meets back up with Cal. And now this is not a sort of kind of not really um, a second chance romance because she met him and had met him several times over the last like 
five or six years. He's a ranger in Yosemite and her father is a governor or something like that. So they spent a lot of time in that park um, with her when she was like a teenager into her 20s. And she kind of developed a thing for Cal. She thought he was pretty cute and she used to try and hunt him out. And one time her and her girlfriends got lost. So she purposely, because she knew his phone number, called him to get him to come rescue them. I didn't care for her. I, I didn't mind Cal. It's her I didn't care for. I found her very bratty. Um, she felt that she was being treated as a little girl. Well, when you're acting like that, yeah, that's how people are going to treat you. And she's now in her late 20s. And, you know, they had an ill-advised kiss at one point, um, you know, like a year earlier. His wife died um, in an avalanche or something like that. And, I mean, there was all these things going on. So they're essentially spending the summer together at Yosemite National Park. Um, and, you know, of course, romance is going to ensue from there. But, like, the, the one thing that bothered me is they kept referring to her as a kid. But she was like 21 when they first met. So she wasn't a teenager. She was in her early 20s when she would travel there with her father. And But they still talked about her as if she was a little kid. But maybe that's the way she acted. So I didn't like that aspect of it from Cal's point of view. Now, from Alex's point of view, she wanted to be taken more seriously. So she cut all of her hair and she got this cute little short little bob. And she bought some, you know, like ranger type clothing. Like, you know, the you know, boots and, you know, khakis and stuff like that that you'd wear, like, if you were trail, like, walking and stuff like that. And immediately she starts getting taken, and that always drives me crazy when, when that change happens. She shouldn't have had to have changed any of that. She, she should have been taken seriously for her own merit. Doesn't matter what she looks like, but say la vie, it is what it is. So yeah, didn't absolutely love this one, but um, I am going to continue on with the Creature Comfort series because I do love stories that involve animals, and I think there's two more in this series, so I will definitely pick up the next one. It's no, sorry, it's no fault of the author or anything like that. This story just didn't vibe with me, and you know, that happens, and it is what it is. Um, the next book that I finished, talking about going from here to here, um, <laughs> Outlander by Diana Gabaldon. I just love this book. Let's just sit on that just for a second. <laughs> um, this I labeled as a historical romance. This is a historical romance, historical fiction, sci-fi, fantasy, romance. It's all the things. Like, if there is a genre, mystery, there's thriller aspects in here. You know, like, this is, this is, this is a book that really crosses so many different genres. Um, this is now, this is my fourth read through through this book. Twice on audio, twice like this. No, okay, I shouldn't say that. I've read it twice, back to front, in this format. This isn't the original book I read, or the original copy, I should say. Then I read it once, start to finish, on audio, and this time I delved between audio and print book. Although, for the last two weeks of August, I delved mostly, or mainly, into the audio book, just because it was easier for me um, to get it finished. Um, so, first book in the Outlander series. Um, narrated on audio for the parts I did listen to on audio by Deve the amazing Davina Porter. She is super fantastic. This was originally published in 1991. A Goodreads average rating of 4.22 stars. I, again, gave it five stars. This book will always get five stars from me. For my challenge, for my summer romance book bingo, book with more than 500 pages. <laughs> I am not definitely going to get into what this story is about. There is so much that happens. In these 850 pages, it is the story of Claire and Jamie. The If you've been living under a rock and you haven't heard anything about this, the TV show or you've never heard about this book, it's about our main character, Claire, who after the Second World War, she's reunited with her husband and they've been separated for the length of the entire war. They were both serving in different areas. He was doing something like government, um, like spy kind of thing. And she was a nurse. And... Um, you know, they're taking holiday in uh, Scotland, in the Scotland Highlands, Scottish Highlands, excuse me. And um, after they encounter these mysterious boulders and she touches one, she gets sent back to the 1700s, um, 1730s or something like that, in Scotland. And she meets Jamie. Huh. Jamie. I love Jamie. I love the guy who plays Jamie on Outlander too. <laughs> oh God, he's so good looking. <laughs> That, I mean, bang up job of picking Jamie. Bang up job of picking all the characters for that TV show, in my opinion. I mean, it is so well cast. But anyway, um, and what was brilliant is this read through um, was the first time I've read through it since the show came out. And I've watched the first season, but I haven't continued on because 
I want to read the book and then watch the season. So my goal going forward, I don't think I'm going to read another Outlander this year. These are a lot to take in. There is a lot that happens in these. They are so complex um, that, you know, I, my original plan had been, you know, like, read this one for two months, read the next one for the next two months. But I think I'm going to take a little break till the end of the year and then start up again in January and then maybe take like, read it January, February, and then take maybe two months off. And then, do you know what I mean? Um, just to, to give you, just to give a little break. Um, I know we were doing this as a read along. If you guys want to jump ahead and go ahead with Jet Dragonfly and Amber, please do. Um, don't let me hold you back. Um, but yeah, these are super, super fantastic. Um, I, I don't know what else to say about this. I, I mean, if you have not picked up Outlander, I know it's daunting, you guys. I know it's daunting. I get it. It's so worth it. And I know that so many... I've seen videos on BookTube of people bashing this book to hell and back because of how problematic it is. I'm not defending it. Um, there are some unpleasant things that you read about in this book but it's history in a way you know we can't we 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 can't change history we can learn from it um and you know claire as a more modern woman you know says quite often that this isn't right this isn't the way that you're supposed to treat people or do things and she will speak up so she's almost like the adv advocate so i sometimes have to wonder if the people who are bashing this book are bashing it because they heard so-and-so bashing it or did they actually read it themselves it's such an epic story and at the end of the day diana gabaldon gets all the all the uh the pats on the back for this because this is brilliant this is absolutely brilliant the writing in it is stunning the characters are amazing they jump off the page you know even without the television show you know those of you who hadn't picked it up and i i hope if you haven't don't watch the show first because you'll have that in your head. You know, let the characters speak for themselves through this book. Do you know what I mean? I've read it, like I said, three times before the show came out. So I knew these characters before I saw them on the screen. And that's why I'm saying they did such a great job picking them. But now I have to admit on this re read through, I had, um, you know, the characters from the show in my head as I was reading this. And that wasn't a bad thing. Um, but I'm glad that I had that experience first to appreciate them for who they were and, you know, how they were created by the author and not how they were seen necessarily by a studio exec. So anyway, yeah, I didn't mean to go uh, on this on like a long tangent or anything like that. But again, if you have not read Outlander, please, please read Outlander. They are, they're amazing. Absolutely amazing. The next book that I finished this week was um, Breathless Encounter by Cindy Dees. This is a romantic suspense novel. It is book number one in the Code X series. Um, Harlequin Romantic Suspense number 1716, uh, narrated on audio by Robin Ann Rappaport, um, published originally in 2012, uh, Goodreads average of 3.95 stars. I gave this one three and a half stars. For my summer romance book bingo, this one was for my borrowed book, because uh, I borrowed this one from the Audible Escape Package. This was also another 40 Years of Harlequin project book. Whoops, I almost dropped my tablet. And yes, I did listen to it on audio. So originally... My, the book that I had picked for 2012 was called Flash of Death by the same author, by Cindy Dees. And it was book two in the Code X series. So I was, I got to the, like last week, I was looking at my TBR, what I had to finish before the end of the month, what I needed to finish for my summer romance book, Bingo. And I was getting a little like, well, I get all the things done. And I had so many um, print books to read that I didn't think I was going to have time to get through them all, especially trying to finish Outlander. Um, so... I thought maybe I can find this flash of death book on audio so I searched it and it wasn't available but the first book in the codex series was by the same author and it was published in the same year so I counted it so it was part of my four years of Harlequin project it was my 2012 book so all is well I was super happy about that so and this story excuse me um, is the story of Sunny and Aiden. And this is another one, as I talked about at the very beginning of this video, of my fear of water. This is another one that primarily takes place in the ocean. <laughs> so essentially, I thought this was very, very cool. That the premise of this story is about this woman by the name of Sunny. And she is, um, she grew up on the water and she is trying to get, she's trying to put a documentary together about deep sea fishermen doing things that are less than legal. Let's put it that way. Um, you know, people who will catch sharks 
and just cut off their fins and then throw the shark back in the water kind of an idea like that really bad stuff that happens um and um she's out doing some filming and this ship ends up crashing into hers and she ends up her ship ends up like being destroyed she has to go under and like she jumps off the boat and she almost drowns and she's saved by Aiden and Aiden is patrolling it this takes place like in the South Indian Ocean like that area of the world and um he's on this yacht that is actually patrolling for pirates and um you know modern day pirates of course and um he's kind of special in a way and I don't want to give away too much about it but he's this this book is it's it's a it's a romantic suspense obviously because they're trying to figure out who it was who attacked Sonny's ship or Sonny's boat and why they did that and you know what's going on and what military intelligence has something to do with this and you know there's kind of this whole mystery involving around that and around the pirates that Aiden and his crew are searching for and there's this other thing, uh, the Code X part of it, where this book almost delves into the scientific, um, or not scientific, science fiction realm, if you will, because he has been gen genetically modified to be able to hold his breath underwater a lot longer than a normal person should. <laughs> and it's really interesting. I thought that part of it was quite interesting. The reason that this, this book did not get four stars for me is because Sunny kind of drove me nuts. She seemed so immature at so many points in the book. Um, there was also, of course, an insta-love aspect to this, which is usually what happens with these romantic suspense books. They've known each other three days and oh, they can't live without each other, that kind of a thing, right? Um, you take it for what it is. I also have to admit, if you're going to read this book, I recommend, even though it's part of the Audible Escape Package, maybe don't get it on audio. The narrator on this one sounded super young. Like it sounded like a 12 year old was narrating this. It was it was a little off putting to be honest. And that may have partially aided in the fact of how I dislike Sunny. You know, I try to I try to separate the two like the story itself to the audio. So I'm not rating the audio on this. I wish they pick, picked a different narrator though. Because you know, it, it is the way it sounds. It's like it you picture that in your head. And I know that's why a lot of people go, well, then there, see, maybe you shouldn't listen to audio. But no, audio is fantastic, just like anything else. Occasionally you get a bad one. This was a good story, though. And you know what? Yeah, maybe it would have gotten four stars, but it was good. It wasn't great. It was interesting. You know what? I'm going to stick with my three and a half because I think that's perfectly, that's that's better than average. You know what I mean? Um, and I did like it. So if you like that kind of romantic suspense with, like I said, it's slight science-y, fiction-y aspect to it with this genetic modification thing that, that's happening with stem cells and stuff. Um, you know, it was, it was really, really interesting and, and I liked it. And again, it, the whole, my whole fear of water, a lot of time is spent in the water on this book. So, but it wasn't to the extent of the blue. Um, and what I mean by that is like the thrillery, aspect of the deep kind of an idea but yeah still still highly enjoyable and I didn't I, I you know I obviously really liked it um next book I finished <laughs> Marianne versus Logan by Ann M. Merton uh this is of course a middle grade fiction novel it is Babysitter's Club book number 41 originally published in 1991 uh Goodreads average of 3.58 stars this is one of my higher rated Babysitter's Club books guys I gave this one four stars so in this book I really loved how Marianne's character kind of grew and stood up for herself even more. Um, Marianne has always been the shyest of all the babysitters. You know, she doesn't really stand up for herself. And I, as a person, appreciate that because that's me. I, you know, I am the person who, if we all go to a restaurant together and I ordered, you know, penne with Alfredo sauce and mushrooms and they bring it out to me, you know, with chicken, even though I really don't eat chicken, I won't say anything. I will just push it to the side and I will not say anything. That's me. That's the kind of person that I am. Um, you know, I don't like to bother people. I know it sounds silly, doesn't it? I mean, somebody obviously didn't do their job correctly, but I don't like to bother people. That's just me. And I identify with Marianne in that aspect. I'm super shy. I do not like talking in front of people. I don't like, you know, drawing attention to myself. I know, right? I do YouTube videos. <laughs> But I'm doing them in front of a camera in my living room without, which is my cats here, you know. Yes, this goes out online. And it's funny because in my real life, I don't generally talk about this. I have a coworker that I've been working with now for about six months. And I just actually mentioned this to her in passing. And she's like, you, you do what now? 
you do stuff on YouTube. So, you know, I, I totally appreciate Marianne's character. And in this book, um, Logan has started kind of taking, I don't want to say taking advantage of her because he's not taking advantage of her, but he's like plowing over her in a way like, this is what we're going to do and this is when we're going to do it and I'm going to call you and you're going to come out with me and we're going to go ice skating and we're going to, I mean, nothing, nothing, you know, that shouldn't be happening amongst 13 year olds, but just more taking charge. Maybe that's the word I'm looking for. You know, like he's taking charge of the relationship. It doesn't matter what she wants to do. It's what he wants to do. So she calls a break to their relationship and says, maybe we should cool things down for a bit. So he kind of begrudgingly agrees to it. And then a week or so goes by and it's Valentine's Day and he plans this surprise romantic dinner for them. And he's like, all right, we had our cooling off period. So are we back together? Or so I guess we're back together now. And Marianne's like, well, no, I, I didn't say that. And he's like, well, I'm ready. And she's like, but I'm not. And, you know, spoiler alert at the end, I mean, it's a middle grade novel, you guys, they end up breaking up. And, you know, I totally appreciate that. I, I like the fact that they took it in that direction, that they didn't just make it all better at the end that this was real life and these are real things that you know teenagers are going to go through i mean yes they're only 13 but they're still teenagers and again i really like how marianne finally stood up for herself and said no i've had enough and this isn't going to work you know like i've tried we've we've tried and she she tried talking to him and you know nothing happens um so yeah so i i enjoyed this one out of out of all the ones i've read over the last little while this has been one of my favorites um i really really liked it and the last book that I finished this week, speaking of things that are my favorites, Deliances, Deliances, am I saying that word right? And Devotions by Felicity Grossman. Oh, this was so good, you guys. So this is a historical romance novel, um, book number two in the Truitts series. This was published originally in 2019. Good rate, uh, good rates, good reads average rating of 4.40 stars. Um, my rating four and a half stars. I love this one. Um, for my challenges, this was for my summer romance book bingo and it was for a book with fire on the cover. I'm just going to wait and let you guys figure out how I got to that. <laughs> no, seriously. Again, I was scrounging at the end because I had to get a full card. I had to, I'm sorry. So I messed around with it and I just said the category was it had to have fire on the cover. The word fire is spelt out in the cover using the letters from both the author's name and from the title of the book. Yay me. <laughs> so yeah, so that's how I worked that one. Yeah, again, it's my challenge. <laughs> I can do whatever I want because I'm not eligible for any prizes, right? So yeah. So anyway, um, I love this book. So this is book two in the Truett series, but I can say for a fact, you do not have to have read the first book to read the second book because I read the first book earlier this year. And I got this one, I got the first book, um, Appetites and Virtues, from um, from Read Bliss to do a video for them, uh, the historical romance video that I did earlier this year. I will leave a link to that in the description box below if you guys haven't seen it and if you're interested. I kind of, it was so much fun. I got to go through all these different historical periods and talk about all these different books. It was super exciting. But anyway, so... I read that book and then when I saw this one, oh, and, and I got this one from NetGalley, so I forgot to mention this. I do apologize. Thank you so much to NetGalley and the publisher for um, providing me with this book to review. And anyway, I, um, I saw this one come up and I'm like, yes, I want to read the second book. So throughout the very beginning, like all throughout, up until 75% of the way through this book, I could not figure out how it connected to the first book. Other than the fact that the female lead, uh, uh, Amelia, is it Amelia? Yeah, she has the same last name as A, the title of the series, the Truitts, she's Amelia Truitt, and the, f the same last name as the character in the first book. So I'm like, is she a cousin? Is she a this? I, I couldn't figure it out. It, it a little slow on the upt uptake, you guys. This is actually, and I thought this was brilliant, and I would love to see a, a series like this and I'm actually now thinking about it debating on writing one <laughs> where the first book in the series follows um, two characters this book Amelia is the daughter of those two characters so this is their child and I'm like so tempted is this gonna be the only two books in the series are we gonna continue on again and get like Amelia's kid cuz that would be awesome so Amelia's parents book took place um, well before the Civil War. And this is also America. These these take place 
in the US. Um, this one primarily like the Philadelphia area. Um, and this one takes place just after the Civil War is the time period we're looking at. So the premise of this story, which I haven't even gotten into yet, sorry about that, is about our main character, Amelia. And she has been married twice. She's only, I think, 24 or 25, but she's been married twice. And when she was a teenager, she had a, a relationship of sorts with this guy by the name of David, who is was best friends with her brother. And but he was David's almost like from the wrong side of the tracks. Amelia's from a very well-to-do family, um, a banking family. Uh, they are Jewish as well, which was super super interesting throughout the whole book. You got so many Jewish words and customs and uh, holidays they talked about and things. I spent like a good parts of the book googling stuff like what does this mean? But I like the fact that they didn't dumb it down by feeling the, the need for the characters who are both Jewish to explain it to each other. I, I really appreciated that. It would have been very helpful to me as a non-Jewish person to know that but I like but I've seen that sometimes you, you see that like you know it'll be two doctors talking to each other oh, we're going to do this and this, and then they go into an explanation like the other doctor has no idea what they're talking about. But they're doing that for the benefit of the reader, right? But I like that they didn't do that. One thing I will say, though, what would have been really cool would have been like a part at the back where if she listed some of these phrases or holidays or things that they talked about um, and kind of gave a quick little explanation for them, like an appendix of, of some kind, you know, for the, for the non... Um, non-Jewish person who wouldn't have known that. I have a couple of Jewish friends. I, I had a Jewish best friend growing up. So some of it I did know, um, but a lot of it I didn't know because it was, of course, older, like after the Civil War. So, you know, um, but anyway, um, so yeah, so she, back to her. So <laughs> she's been married twice and she now is divorced for the second time and she is writing a an advice column for women on how to dress and how to act and things like that, like a Miss Manners kind of an idea. And she also runs a charity on the sly under an, under an assumed name because, of course, Jewish people are, of course, at this time not necessarily persecuted, but they weren't necessarily thought highly upon. And she runs this charity to help other women who are also going through divorces who cannot afford to do so so they can retain some of their property and possessions in the time of a divorce. Because, of course, as soon as you married somebody back then, you married a man, he got you became his property along with everything that you owned became his property so in this way she was trying to help these women um so anyway she has been getting death threats at the beginning of this book and david who now works for the pinkerton agency he he uh phil um served in the civil war with um amelia's brother simon her brother simon was killed and you know he's kind of doing his duty now working for the pinkerton agency he's been hired by amelia's other brother um, to kind of watch over her. So the entire bulk of the book takes place on this train trip between um, somewhere else, somewhere in Philadelphia. I can't remember the two points of location. But like these things happen and of course a relationship blooms again between Amelia and David. This book gets very hot and spicy. Let me tell you guys, very hot and spicy. Very well written though, let me, let me say that too. Super, super fantastic. I absolutely loved it. It was such a nice change from your typical Regency historical romances I loved it. I loved that Amelia had this great attitude to her and that David was just a stand-up guy and their relationship was super, super spicy. And again, one of my favorite parts about this book, and like I said, you don't find this out until 25 or 75% of the way through. It was probably mentioned more towards the beginning, but I may have missed it. <laughs> that could have been totally reader error on my behalf. But then, you know, when you find out that it's, oh, she's so-and-so's daughter light bulb moment um and i so love that aspect and i so want her to write a third book with it being like and what a great way to travel through history with one family do you know what i mean i, I just i love those kind of family saga stories and to have it as a series i think would be super fantastic but anyway that's just me um so yeah absolutely love this um highly recommend you all go ahead and pick it up fantastic 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 so anyway guys that is all that I have for this video. I do hope that you guys enjoyed it. Please let me know in the comments below. Again, what is your favorite Agatha Christie book? Because I need to know that. I need to, I, I'm thinking really hard about doing this in 2020, about doing an Agatha Christie book a month. Because most of them are available on audio, so they'd be, and they're not terribly long either. So kind of super easy to get through in a way. Um, but let me know your favorites so I can add them to my jar maybe for next year. Um, also, let me know if you've read any of these books and what you thought about them or what was your favorite book that you read 
last week. And until my next video, everybody, take care and happy reading. Thank you all so much for watching. Bye, guys.